Today I have been working on completing our little Viking style anvils. I've even made a few other styles in the last week. So if you want to see what I've been up to with the other anvils, if you want to watch the hardening and tempering process on the ones we made initially, come join me and let's get to work. Let's take a look at hardening and tempering the anvils that were inspired by the Mastermere find. Most of these are made out of 4140, except for this one little tiny one, which is made out of 5160. But both 4140 and 5160 are oil hardening steels, and they're close to the same hardening temperature. I'm going to go ahead and do these in the gas forge because it's just going to be the most efficient way for me to get these done. They certainly originally would have been done probably in charcoal if they were hardenable. A lot of these may not have had a high carbon face on them. We don't know that for sure. And I have here the five anvils that we looked at forging in the previous two videos, plus a few others. Now, when I originally did these, I was looking more at the striking surface and not worrying too much about the body of the anvil, just loosely interpreting that. But after looking a little bit more closely at these anvils and looking in the book, these really tapered a lot more than the way I interpreted them originally. The striking face is similar size, but the body of the anvils were much skinnier. And I think it was important to go ahead and do this because I have another theory on what these might have been used for. And the same thing sort of applies with this other smaller yet chunkier little anvil. So I've tried to interpret these a little bit more in keeping with the images in the book. Still 4140, still a hardenable steel. So let's go ahead and get the forge hot and put something in there to preheat our oil. It's always important to preheat your oil when oil hardening. And we have looked at the hardening and tempering process numerous times. So I'm going to go through this kind of quick. So I have the original five anvils out of the book that we had done and you've seen the videos on these. I have these other two that I just showed you that are my second go around at, the, at these. So that's just a few extras. And then I made one that is a little bit more in keeping with most of the examples that I can find online, both museum examples and reproductions that other people have made. This is a substantially larger anvil, but still small by today's standards. And we're going to go ahead and harden temper all of these. I probably won't show every single one of them. The procedure is exactly the same for all eight of them, except that this one gets heated to 50 degrees cooler than the others, which I probably won't be able to judge by eye anyways. I'm going to go ahead and start with these chunkier small anvils. I'm just going to let them soak in the forge with it hot but off. Now I'm just going to cycle the forge on and off so that they don't heat too fast. The more evenly heated they are, the more even your hardness and tempering job will be. You can certainly do this in a coal forge. You can do it in coke, you can do it in charcoal, which is probably what the Vikings were working in, is a charcoal forge. You can do it in an electronic heat treating oven. The smaller anvils you could probably do with an oxyacetylene or an oxypropane torch. Fifteen seventy-five is the right hardening temperature for forty-one forty, and you just have to learn to judge that by eye. And that's one reason an electronic oven is so much nicer because you just set it to the right temperature. And if you use an electronic oven, after a while you start to recognize better what the incandescent temperatures are telling you. So that one's ready. Get the oil good and hot here. Probably a little overheated. I'm going to cool the face of that off. And I'm going to real quick shine this up with a, an angle grinder. And as soon as I start seeing some of the tempering colors come up into the face there, I think it's kind of hard to hold on to. I mentioned before, if I were making a bunch of these, I'd make tongs just for the job. So that's starting to turn straw and bronze, and I think that's okay to quench. So we're just cleaning these up with my authentic angle grinder, an actual Viking Age angle grinder. At least that's what the guy on eBay told me.
And of course, you don't have to use an angle grinder to shine these up if you're using residual heat to temper with. You can shine these up with a brick, a smooth stone, something of that sort. All of it works, and I was just kidding about that being an authentic Viking angle grinder. That's starting to turn into that bronze color that I'm looking for. Really, this is tempering very nice and evenly. Well, that's all eight of the anvils, hardened and tempered, and I've got a few of them set in this stump. Let's give them a try. Let's see if we can forge something simple, maybe a nail, maybe a hook, something like that, and just see how these work. This is not the ideal setup. It's a little stump sitting on top of the swedge block, and these aren't anchored and set as precisely as they could be. So this is just a test run. If I'm going to use these, I'll probably get a better stump and do a better job of setting them. Definitely have to learn some new skills to keep the workpiece right on the little anvil. And definitely needs to be set down deeper. It counts as forging a nail, but it's a lousy nail. I'm using this little tiny hammer just so it's not something bigger than the anvil face. The hammers in the master mirror find are all much bigger than this. It would also be easier if this was right next to the forge, but I don't have room right there for it. But this little beak works just fine. And this little anvil's not bad. And I think if it was anchored better, it would be pretty darn good for doing a little work like this.
So then what are my thoughts on these anvils or anvil-like objects found in the Mastermere find? Well, this one that was not found in the Mastermere find, this is based on other examples, both museum pieces and other people's recreation of other museum pieces that I have never seen the pictures of. This seems to be a common style of anvil for the Viking Age anvils. Exact weights I'm not sure of. James Austin makes some that are much heavier than this. This one's about six pounds. And I think James Austin has done some that are more in the 10 or 15 pound range. Very useful, just needs to be set in the stump much more solidly than I have. This beaker bick is really a very familiar tool. I've made these that fit the hardy hole in my anvil. If you don't have an anvil with a hardy hole, making one that fits in a stump like this works out great. If you've got a good stump for your anvil, you might be able to put it right next to your, your anvil or whatever you're using as an anvil substitute. Really a useful tool. This larger round one, some people have conjectured that it was handheld and used inside of something. Very possible, that would make a lot of sense. Some people have conjectured that it was held in a pair of tongs and used like a flatter. Again, very possible. Or it may have been set in a stump and used much like this anvil. We'll never know for sure. These two I made a little heavier than what was in the book. Like I said earlier, I made them pretty much match the face size but the ones in the book were really much skinnier in the body. And while this is usable as an anvil, it's not very practical. And I really doubt that this was used the way we would use an anvil. And one of the reasons I say that is when you look at the two that I did that are more exact to the size and dimensions in the book, it just so happens that this one fits down into an ax. And while it isn't an exact fit for the axes I make, it is almost exactly the same size and shape as some of the axes and adzes shown in the book, as well as being the same size and shape as some of the hammer eyes. And if you take a pair of dividers and you compare this image with this image or this image, it's very similar. So I think this was used the way we would use a drift, even though they did not call it a drift. I suspect they realized what it was used for. It's just a matter of terminology. And they just considered that because you hammered on this, it was an anvil of some sort. Again, that's just my personal thought on the subject. I don't know if that's really true or not. We will never know. Now, some of you said you had time machines you were working on trying to get fixed and operational. So I'm looking forward to the reports when you actually go back in time and find this person and see what they were up to. I'm not going to be holding my breath, though. And that then brings us down to this little guy, this little teeny tiny thing that might have been used for working on lock springs or jewelry or somebody suggested chain mail. But somebody else had the idea that this is very similar to some other woodworking bench stops, things that were used to help hold a board on a bench. You set that in the bench, you jam the board into the spike, your board doesn't slip while you're working on it. I hadn't thought of that before myself, but there were carpenter's tools found in this chest. So it is entirely possible that this was a carpenter's tool and not an anvil. Maybe it did both, I don't know. So those are just my thoughts on these various Viking style anvils and my little exploration into this. Remember, these are not museum quality reproductions. These are relatively contemporary. They're simply inspired by the originals. So my materials and my techniques in creating them are not the same as the originals. If you want to experience what that original Viking blacksmith experienced making his tools and working, you're going to need to make a Viking era forge with a pair of small bellows and you're going to have to work without electricity and you're probably going to have to sit on the ground. But if that's what you're into in blacksmithing, by all means, go for it. Anyways, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop, but be safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one.